and his ecstasy at, at 200,000 watts. Um, it's, it's very simple, but it's enormously enjoyable. <laughs> kind of atmosphere is typical of heavy metal gigs. Iron Maiden have a devoted and crazy following. Even bass guitarist Steve Harris admits to being astounded by the reaction of the fans. They do seem to look up the bands. But then, um, I think a lot to do with it is, is because I think really they like to be up there as well, you know. I think they like to imagine themselves being up on stage uh, playing. I think that's probably what it is. I mean, I must admit, you know, when I used to go and see bands before, I always thought, God, you know, I'd love to be up there playing. And, now it's, it's a bit weird looking at it from the other side of the fence, if you know what I mean, like you're up there playing and it crowds all going by me about you, like it's, it's really weird. <laughs> So what is actually happening? Is heavy metal really something new or is it just another name for the hard rock music popular in the early 70s? A lot of heavy metal fans don't like the term revival. They point out that heavy bands like Van Halen and Judas Priest were packing the Hammersmith Odeon throughout the punk rock period. DJ Neil Kay has been playing hard rock for years and doesn't like the label heavy metal. I despise the term heavy metal. I think a little bit of um, an explanatory note here, maybe. The actual term heavy metal is an American term, and it's now been obsolete for about 10 years. It was around shortly after the Woodstock Festival, and uh, it is in actual fact a phrase that is nowadays covered in the States by a term high energy rock. The Americans call it high energy rock. We used to call it either underground rock, progressive rock, hard rock or even better for my part just rock okay it's not a new reassurgence let's establish this fact once and for all shall we if we possibly can as wide across the country as, as is feasible hard rock music never went away <laughs> But if it never actually went away, hard rock certainly became more remote from the audience. Musicians like Eric Clapton and John Lord of Deep Purple may have been technically brilliant, but as their reputations and the venues they played became bigger and bigger, a lot of the excitement went out of rock. Punk succeeded because it put the energy back into music. The new wave of heavy metal, partly a reaction to punk, marks a return to traditional musical values. For me, I've always looked upon the stage as a a much hallowed place, a place of worship for real artists, as I said just before. That doesn't just stem from rock and roll days. To me, uh, Judy Garland was a real artist, Al Jolson was a real artist. People like that gave their all and everything for the stage and most of them finished up dying for it as well. And in my view, nobody should be allowed to stand on a stage unless they can actually present the total professional thing, unless they really can sing and really can play. 
Punk was a total anti-attitude towards music. But punk itself has left a big mark on the new generation of heavy rock bands who play with an energy which is closer to the Sex Pistols than it is to Led Zeppelin. One man who believes there is a new wave of British heavy metal is the deputy editor of Sounds, Jeff, known to his friends as Death, Barton. Of the new bands that have come up, they've certainly been influenced by the new wave and the punk explosion. Um, I mean, they, they play a lot faster now than Black Sabbath did in 1971. They're, they're much faster, they're much more speedy. And um, I think also they, they, they took um, a degree of... Uh, attention from punk in that um, they recorded stuff with they recorded a lot of their independent singles they didn't rely on the record companies to pick them up and build their career <coughs> they just went out played concerts and um, formed their own labels and stuck their own singles out Iron Maiden fit this description very well and like a lot of punk bands they have stayed close to their audience their success has been based up till now on small gigs in pubs and clubs rather than the large venues of the previous generation. Lead singer Paul Diano regards this as an important part of the band's attitude. For instance, like when we played the Rainbow, well, like we had some damage done to the seats here, but you know, what we wanted was the people to get a little bit closer to us, like, because oh, you're so far away from there. That's why we've gone back to doing places like the Marquee now, because the contact is a lot better. Really, I like the smaller venues anyway. Um, I've, I've always agreed with that and the band's always done it since we ever started. When the fans are not following Iron Maiden to the live gigs, they can be found at heavy metal discos like Neil Kay's Bandwagon in North London. More than a thousand heavy metal fans make the pilgrimage to the bandwagon every week and getting played there has been important for Iron Maiden in building up a devoted following. But before Kay turned it into the heavy metal sound house, the bandwagon featured disco music five nights a week. It took five years, really, of very, very hard work and uh, a lot of persistence to change the whole situation around. These days, as you're well aware, we run five nights a week, hard rock, and soul's gone straight out the door, that way, sideways. If I even have atomic scientists, that, trainee scientists that I know of, that are regular members of this place, that still are into hard rock. But one shouldn't presuppose that just because one is a headbanger that um, one has only one sort of situation in life that's totally false they come from all walks of life and most part they're totally honest people heavy metal may attract fans from a wide range of backgrounds but they are mainly male and overwhelmingly white two of the regulars at the bandwagon disco are wedding photographer rob loonhouse and road mender alan day do you get many black kids coming we got one we call him uh Jimmy Hendrix, we call him Hendrix. He's a good laugh. He's really dark, so at first, when I first saw him, I couldn't believe it. But he got joins him with the rest of us. And well, why yeah. do you think it is that not many black kids go? I don't know. They've got their own basic music, haven't they? Which is reggae, which they were brought up on, you know, from the Caribbeans. But as I say, this is more like British stuff, you know, British rock. You find very few women down the front, you know, actually head banging. You know, they're quite content to stay at the back and. You know, sip the orange, you know, and listen to the music. Do you think women make good headbangers? It's very difficult, really, you know, because a lot of women, you know, they don't really have it in them. You know, uh, you find very few women digging holes in the road, you know, so maybe that's one of the reasons why, you know, there's very few women headbangers. With attitudes like that, especially towards women, reflected in a lot of heavy metal lyrics, maybe it's not surprising that blacks and women don't flock to see bands like Iron Maiden. Even the clothes have an aggressive look about them. Patched denims are worn with leather jackets and shiny metal studs. But the uniform has more in common with football fans than with punks, mods, or even skins. If you go wearing a suit or a top seat, that's going to look really ridiculous. People like to wear their hair long and uh, wear leather. It's more comfortable, you know, it's easy, easy going. And if you get messy, you know, someone throws a beer over you, you don't have an argument, you say, OK, you know, sorry about that, I'll point you a point. 
But within this army of leather-clad rock fans, there is an elite to which only the most fanatical are admitted. Rob and Alan both belong to the SAS of the heavy metal army, the Headbangers. You sort of walk in, you think, that's funny what they're doing, it's unusual. Then after a while you start going there regularly, you start getting addicted to it, you know, it's a thing to get stuck into it. Feels good. It's basic for what it is. If there's a particular track that I really like, I can't stand and just listen to it. I've got to go down the front and I've got to headbang to it. Music there from Rush and the current LP, Permanent Waves, and something entitled The Spirit of the Radio. Right now, some Judas Priest from the LP Killing Machine. This one's called Hellbent for Leather. Headbanging is to heavy metal what the pogo was to punk. And at the bandwagon, the mouthful of safety pins has given way to a recurring symbol of rock fantasy, the homemade imitation guitar. to know where the chord changes are, where the solo's coming. Uh, I tend to like to make it look as if I am actually playing and I do actually know what I'm doing. Most people, they just get their heads down, the head goes up and down, and the arms go up and down, and they play the rhythm whilst the lead's in it. Looks a bit stupid sometimes, you know, but, you know, they get off on it. Rob Loonhouse is one of the original bandwagon headbangers and an innovator of the hardball guitar. It might look bizarre, but the headbangers take the plan of their two-dimensional instruments very seriously. Loonhouse built his first guitar in response to a challenge to decide the headbanger of the year. Still, this guy comes up to me and he says, uh, you don't mind if I bring a Gibson body along? He hasn't got no strings or pickups or anything like that. On it. He's just, you know, body in the neck. So I go to him, bring what you believe in life along, mate. Bring an orchestra if you like. Still, anyhow, I got the thinking, you know, this bloke's got the edge on me, you know, he's got a guitar, you know, this is going to stick in people's minds. So I thought to myself, oh, well, make a cut out. So I got cut a bit of what I pulled together, traced out the uh, outline of a flying V, and there it was, it started from there. Why the flying V, particularly? Well, I only had a couple of days to do it. It was all straight lines, and it's easy to cut out. <laughs> do you go into detail on them? I mean, stuff on the actual thing? Uh, first of all, you know, the first one, you know, it was very rough, you know. I cocked my neck up, the neck was too wise, you know, the body wasn't big enough. Uh, on the latest one at the moment, I've got the neck right, I've got the body right, uh, I've put a tremolo on it, I've put a couple of bits of uh, sticky tape on it, you know, brighten it up a bit, you know, so from a distance it does look a bit like a real guitar, you know. Has it got frets on it? No, oh, no, I don't bother with frets, you know. Uh, I think it's taking the piss a bit, really, you know, when you put frets on it, you know, you're making it look too much like a real guitar. It's supposed to look like a guitar, but it's not really supposed to look like a real guitar, you know. You know, it's only supposed to be kind of like a Harley Quinn of a real guitar, you know, just an image. How many have you made? Uh, I've got about three at home at the moment. I've got, a, I've got a V, I've got a twin neck V, and I've got an inverted V, which I made specially, 
which is a bit of a flop, really. In all, I've made about half a dozen. Uh, progressively getting better all the time. Heavy metal boom is being taken seriously by the fans with their imaginary guitars. It's certainly causing a stir in the offices of the record companies. Iron Maiden was signed to EMI last year, but when they formed in 1976, punk was what was selling. And as Steve Harris explains, when the band were first offered a recording deal four years ago, they were told punk was what they had to play. But they want us to get us a cut of air and all that sort of thing. And, uh... You know, just say, well, no way, because it's not what we want to do, you know. It's, and this place, they want us to play more commercial music. So, you know, it was, I mean, it, it was, people say, oh, was, you know, was it easy to, uh, or hard to sort of um, just turn down a deal or anything like that. But it, it's, it's not hard to do something um, when you don't like what you're going to have to do, sort of thing, you know. It's just not hard to stick to your guns if, if you're uh, into what you're doing, you know. After that first offer, Iron Maiden decided to take action. They sent a demo tape to Neil Kay at the bandwagon, and when the tape began to feature in the chart which Kay compiled from fans' requests, the band decided to take the next step and release it on their own label, Rock Hard Records. Finally, the major record companies woke up to the selling power of heavy metal, and the band signed with EMI. Their first album went straight into the charts, but since 76, record sales overall have declined. And although the companies may see heavy metal as a way out of their current recession, they are using increasingly desperate publicity stunts to promote the new sound. Jeff Barton thinks the hype may have gone too far. Yes, I, I think the record companies uh, are promoting the so-called heavy metal revival um, very crassly and very badly. Um, for example, one record company um, made the offer of uh, giving away a free cardboard guitar with every album purchased. And that, that's like marketing it like it's soap powder at the moment, really. Um, it was all very well when heavy metal was popping on the grass loots level and uh, the kids used to go out and get a bit of hardboard and hack it into the shape of a flying V and, and just do it because they wanted to do it. But it's been reduced to a mindless trend now when you've got cardboard guitars ready made for you and you can go in a shop and get one free with every purchase of such and such an album. It's completely ridiculous and it, I think it ruins all the, all the sort of novelty of it and the, and the, the genuine uh, good times and uh, the actual interest that was there at the beginning. I think, uh, I think it's going completely over the top, really. Still, provided they can survive the hype, Iron Maiden are on the verge of becoming a very successful band. Next month, they start a European tour, and there are plans for them to tour the States. Aren't they on the way to becoming superstars like the previous generation of heavy rockers? I don't think so, really, because, like, we've been slogging away for a long time, you know. I mean, I know we've gone from playing clubs to concert halls in about sort of six months, which is a big jump, but then again, the band's been going about, like, four and a half years. We've done a lot of groundwork, and it, you don't forget things like that, you know. So I don't think it sort of go to our heads, if that's what you mean. You know, we still keep a, you know good contact with the audience. Um, you know, when we come out after gigs, we you know all the sign all the autographs and like meet meet them all and that. You know, you know sort of really well we go out of a way to you know to keep in with them as well. You know, because you know, we just like talking to them and that. You know. We just made one little tiny crack, really. I mean, we got loads of work to do. I mean, all right, we can sell out most of the major venues in Britain. We got the rest of the moving world to go. Yeah, we got we got to start all back in square one again.
Miming to the music is as close as fans like Rob Loonhouse will ever get to stardom. We asked Loonhouse why he didn't get himself a real instrument and learn to play. <laughs>
With the head, with the fucking grouper here, <laughs> my brother Jean Paul. Jean Paul. Oh. With this lesson, <laughs> we shall all sing for you uh. some heavy metal. Right. Alors, uh. un, deux, un, deux, trois, quatre. Some heavy metal. Alors, 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 some heavy metal. Saying to you, bonsoir, bon appart, yeah. and bonkers. And don't forget, next week we shall be looking at the raspberries. Oh, what? Oh. The scream! That's the scream! Scream! Serious. Uh, Steph, just let's quickly run through the history of Iron Maiden because you, you formed the group sort of 1977 when heavy metal wasn't quite so in vogue as it is now, was it? Actually, it was a little bit before that. Was about it? 76. Yeah. So it was just before the punk thing was sort of coming in. And, you and were... uh, we had a real lot of trouble getting work, you know, sort of during the punk times and that, you know. A few people tried to pressurise you into changing into a punk band, didn't they? Yeah, there's a couple of record companies which I won't name. They yeah. sort of asked us to cut our hair and that, and so we said, uh, well, I won't tell you what we said, but... Uh, <laughs> Thank you for that. We said no anyway. You said no, right, in the yeah. nicest possible way. Clive, you, of course, joined about 1979. Yeah. The tide was turning and you, you had quite a bit of success. Yeah, it was quite quickly, uh, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, with the first album, it really went well for us. You know, went straight into the charts at number four and done really well, and we haven't really looked back since then. So from sort of humping all your own gear around and all that oh, trudging around, change, you're yeah. suddenly yeah. the big time. Lovely. Now, uh, Bruce, you only joined a few months ago, didn't you? Yeah, just after uh, after August last year, no, September last year. I know Iron Maiden have had a few lineup changes, but they had been fairly settled. Was it quite difficult for you uh, going in and joining an established band or established not, lineup? Not, not really, because we sort of known each other for quite a long while. Yeah. From, my sort of, from my last band I was in, so I mean it, uh, it all fitted in really well. Really, I mean it, it's, we like the same sort of music, so yeah. it's no real problem. Really. Yeah, yeah. Now last year you did a thing called the Killer Tour, which very appropriately named because you did something like what was it, 120 gigs in how many months? About six and a half months. I mean, did you find it actually killing? It sounds horrendous. So what was yeah, it was a bit, you know, a bit sort of much towards the end, but we uh, yeah. really enjoyed it. It was great. We went to so many countries and that. So. Because you have got success all over the world, haven't you? It's, it's, it's in fact, really, yeah. you'll probably sell more records in other countries than here, don't you? Yeah. We do, yeah. Um, the States really is uh, the one that we're trying to so you're break trying to now. break. Yeah. yeah, you're off to the States shortly, aren't you? Yeah, a couple of months we'll be over there. It's and Japan, you've been invo voted sort of top group, most promising group and all this, so you're going there as well, are you? Yeah, we'll be off to Japan again as well. So you start a British show when? February the... 25th. 25th, and you'll be off for... 
quite a few months then. About eight months. Yeah. yeah. Now, we had Lemmy here last week, and he was saying that Motorhead had found it difficult to get into the studio because they spent so much time touring, they found it difficult to record. Do you have that problem? Yeah, we've had exactly the same problem. I mean, yeah. in fact, we're still, after this show, we go straight down and finish off the album, you know. Yeah, um, and that'll be out shortly, will it? Yeah, it comes out March the 5th. Now, sitting behind you is a person called Eddie. Now, Iron Maiden fans will probably recognise him Eddie. instantly. Yes. Tell, me, tell me very briefly, Steve, because I'm going to go a frantic wind-up. The history of Eddie. Well, we used to have this backdrop uh, when we was playing the pubs with this little we built. Yeah. There's blood come out the mouth and we sort of thing. We built another one. It was a bit bigger. Lights come out the eye and smoke. We used to call it Eddie the Ed. And uh, it just kind of expanded into this, like, uh, so he's like this your... thing here, you know. Oh, he keeps flying this around, actually. Is he sort of like your mascot, Bruce? He's very fat at the moment, actually. Is he? <laughs> He needs to go on a diet. Well, if he goes on tour, as soon as the way. Now, Eddie's going to give away that jacket, isn't he? Good vibe. Yes, this, uh, this Woo! American tour. What do they have to do to win it, uh, Clive? Well, they've got to guess um, what song Eddie comes on in on our set. When we do a live set a yes. show, what song does he come on in? Okay, entries to our usual address, of course, which is uh, Tiswas Central, uh, P.O. Box 333. Good day to you. I would like to say that... Do you mind? I would like to say that the, the entertainment value provided by gentlemen such as yourselves is of immense value in these difficult times. May I... May I express my thanks? 